Thank you so much, Mr. Vestavella, um, especially for the heartfelt finish. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know the procedures. Um, there is a microphone in the middle, and those of you who are sitting in the front rows have the privilege of actually accessing the microphones uh, by printing. Let me start off with the lady over there, and please keep up your hands so that I can see you. Gentlemen, why don't you walk over to the microphone, please? And you start in pressing the red button, please. Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Julia Dacolas. I'm from Brazil. Um, uh, Mr. Wessewelle, es ist eine Ehre für mich, die Möglichkeit mit Ihnen zu sprechen. Ich, als ein Beispiel für diesen großen Austausch, ich meine, ich habe meine Masterarbeit hier gemacht und ich bin ganz froh, dass ich Möglichkeit, um hier zu haben habe. Und ich Entschuldigung wegen meiner Fälle, ich bin ein bisschen nervös. Äh, ich wollte einfach fragen, können Sie ein bisschen mehr erzählen über die Deutschland Interesse, über diese ganze äh, Studienaustausch zum Beispiel. Wir sehen, dass heutzutage Deutschland ist seine Ziel, seine Destination für diese ganze akademische Bildung oder Austausch. Was ist die Interesse in diesem Austausch zwischen Deutschland und der ganzen Welt in Schwerpunkt mit diesem, äh, äh, was soll ich sagen, Wissenschaftsaustausch und hochqualifizierte Studien, PhD? Und diese andere Programm. Warum, ist Deutschland, äh, warum bemüht sich Deutschland, um diese Aktionen zu promovieren? Vielen Dank. Die Antwort ist sehr einfach, weil uh, Deutschland ein Land ist mit keinen no natürlichen Ressourcen. Uh, wir haben kein Öl, wir haben kein Gas. Uh, was wir haben, ist Wissen und Kreativität. Und das uh, ist uh, unsere Erfolgsgeschichte. Und wir denken, dass in Zeiten der Globalisierung das mehr und mehr wichtig wird. And for example, uh, when we look to Brazil, because you're coming from Brazil, you can see one thing, that the German engagement, the economic and the political engagement, is always sustainable. We always are interested in long-term engagements, in long-term partnerships. So there may are some countries worldwide which have the idea we go into a country, invest, take the profit, go home, and have a nice life. But For example, in Brazil we can see, since decades now, that our interest is sustainable. We are seeking for partnership between equals. We want to share our knowledge, because we think it's in the mutual interest. We want to interlink our uh, societies. And how does it start? It starts when you're young. This is... Um, a very simple, but from my point of view, a very convincing uh, philosophy and policy and strategy. We had this year the honor and the um, opportunity to open the House of Science in Sao Paulo. Just one example. And we have the goal that uh, probably in the next years we will have 10,000 of Brazilian students being guests here in Germany. I think I do not know it exactly without my, my uh, um, minutes here, but I think uh, at the moment it's around about 3,000. I'm, I'm not, don't, don't, don't quote me please uh, this time. And um, <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure about this. I have to ask my officials uh, if they know it better. But I think round about this, is, the figure is right. And I think this shows you a lot of potential. I, I would like to answer with one, one personal experience that I would like to tell you. I, was, I studied law uh, here in Bonn. I grew up here in Bonn. This is my, really my hometown. Uh, no, my home city. And I grew up here. And I was uh, a scholar. I had a scholarship from uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Some of you know the foundations. They are, we are very proud about our foundations, not only Friedrich Naumann, but also all the others, Konrad Adenauer, Friedrich Ebert, they do an excellent work. And 10 years ago, I visited, as party chairman, I visited um, South Korea. And um, you remember Walter. And uh, I, had a, I had a meeting, a lunch meeting, with a lady, she was in my age. And 
she welcomed me in her office or in the restaurant, I remember, and she said, Guido, it's so nice to meet you. And I was a bit surprised because I felt that this is not Asian protocol. And I had no idea with, with whom I was talking at the moment. I was really, I said, and she said in a wonderful, charming German with this beautiful pronunciation, she said, can't you remember in the 80s? We were both, you in Bonn, I'm in Konstanz, with the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. And you know why I'm telling this, not only for sentimental reasons. The main reason is, if you have, she's now a member of the government, or she was in those days, member of the government in South Korea. I mean, this is the best foundation for every exchange, for every ideas which you want to implement between countries. So it's much more than just to give some individual, successful individual and young people personal chances for their career. It's really a political philosophy which is behind this. Thank you so much for that in-depth answer. I have three more questioners um, that already have a microphone, so I would like to encourage this gentleman to start off. The gentleman over there with a beautiful hat, and uh, I believe one of our bloggers has uh, also the microphone. These three questions, one after the other, please be short and brief so that we can actually get the answer to your question. I mean, you are not asked to be short, I'm asked to be short. This is a uh, <laughs> diplomatic I way of putting it. it. <laughs> Sometimes I can read between the lines. <laughs> please. Thank you for the möglichkeit uh, eine Frage zu stellen. Um, you spoke earlier about the fact that Latin America, Africa um, were not represented, for instance, within the Security Council. And you have now proposals, for instance, within Africa of getting a representative into the Security Council. We know Brazil wants a seat, India wants a seat, South Africa wants a seat, possibly Nigeria. Um, but is this um, an effective way of, of improving you know, the effectiveness of the Security Council, simply adding more members, uh, giving them a veto into an institution which is, has largely been seen as uh, ineffective and serving uh, geopolitical interests. Will it make it more um, effective or do we need new ideas to create better effective uh, international institutions? Thank you. Thank you very much this for is, that question. Straight away, okay. I think this is uh, absolutely a key question. This is why we are discussing some, some uh, different models, uh, how we can manage this. Uh, and there is an ongoing discussion. We have, uh, together with Japan, with India and Brazil, we have a format which is called G4. There are others, of course, who work with us together. I had a very interesting exchange with uh, Foreign Minister um, of uh, South Africa about this. Other uh, countries. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that there's also competition between the, co between the countries on the continent, but this is, not my, this is not my business. My business is the idea that we have to mirror the political balance what we have on the, in the world now into the international institutions. And probably, you're right, probably we will have a discussion about other ways to represent uh, the different regions in the world. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't forecast the result, uh, but I can say it is important to work on this and not to give up, because there are, of course, uh, veto powers in the Security Council and uh, we have to see how we can balance the, the uh, Security Council better, that it will be more representative. My concern is, because I'm, I'm really a strong supporter of the United Nations, my concern is, if we will not change it in the next years, we will weaken them. And this couldn't be in our interest. Thank you very much. The gentleman over there. Thank you very much. My name is Abubakar Jijiwa from Nigeria. 
Thank you for recognizing my cup. Um, when we are talking about globalization, my concern is in two areas. One is the issue of, um, you have already made mention of the fact, fact that some of our developing countries, the population, the young population is very high. As high as 75% is probably under the age of 20. And this represents huge potential, but it also represents a lot of danger. Um, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the cancer of endemic corruption that still exists in many parts of Africa and Asia. And I'm worried that virtually no corruption takes place if there is no cooperation from the European banks and financial institutions and conglomerates in Europe which are operating in Africa. And I, I have not seen any concerted effort by European Union, for example, in trying to prevent money laundering by banks and financial institutions, because that's why the most of the money, corruption is bad, but if you can steal money and invest in your country, it's a little bit better than taking the money to financial institutions outside. Uh, what is, are you doing? Second point on the issue of uh, globalization, because you talked about globalization of, uh, of values. Some of us get concerned when you see certain things that even by European and American standards do not, are, are really not considered correct, being passed as laws such as gay marriages, marriage between man and man, woman and woman. I, I, it, is, it is something very against even globalization, we think. And I, I don't know, the there's a big contradiction in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like Thank you. About first of all, I think um, I'm not sure if I if I understood your point, but I, I have to say uh, very clear and, and uh, very frank. From my point of view, there is no alternative for no country to good governance. Good governance is the key to the success of a country and to a prosperous development of the people. So the fight against corruption is not only a technical question, it is, from my point of view, a right where the normal societies, the less privileged people are asking for, and they are absolutely right. Good governance is the key, from my point of view. And I'm traveling, I'm traveling, I'm not, I'm not addressing this to, this to a specific country, uh, but I think uh, when you are traveling around the world, you, you, sometimes you can see, if you just come from one country to the neighbor country, with the same frame and, and circumstances, natural circumstances, uh, what a big difference it is if there is good governance or not. This does not mean that, that we have to uh, create uh, Western uh, government models uh, worldwide, this is not my idea. But good governance, which means also including uh, the fight against corruption, is from my point of view absolutely crucial. And about the values you ask uh, you, with your second question, I'm not talking about Western values, and I'm not talking about the values of, of myself, I'm talking about universal uh, values. The values of the Charter of United Nations. And I think this is something where we all could agree on. Thank you very much. Two more and then we'll uh, finish off. Um, the gentleman and the lady to finish it all off. First of all, could you please introduce yourself? Hello. It's working. Trust our technicians. Is it working? It is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Shahid Al Alam from Bangladesh. Uh, thank you, Foreign Minister, for a scintillating speech. But uh, coming from a country like Bangladesh, which I call majority world countries because we don't like the term third world, um, I must question what we feel is perhaps the gap between what is said and what is practiced. Uh, and I wonder whether this beautiful statement is merely rhetoric or not. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm trying to bring up a pertinent point. Uh, because 
while sweeping statements about democracy are made, the action of many of the nations in terms of what is considered the move towards democracy is certainly very questionable. Uh, I recognize what you say about education. I, I believe it firmly myself. But the biggest aggressors in the world today are very educated people with high levels of literacy. Yet they're going around killing people, occupying lands, uh, behaving atrociously to fellow human beings. The United Nations is not a United Nations. Uh, and that is problematic. And the very concept of the Security Council, I think, is problematic because you have a group of nations who have initially a veto, which has nothing to do with democracy. You also have nations which are the biggest producers and suppliers of arms in charge of keeping peace. It's like having a pedophile looking after ch children. Um, and I do find it very, very problematic. Well, I think, I'm not sure if you uh, really mean about education what I understood, um, because um, I have just been in your wonderful country. I just, have, uh, I just enjoyed the hospitality in uh, Bangladesh until Sunday morning. And I visited, for example, in Dakar, uh, something which is called a slum. And um, I met these young boys and girls in the age of uh, eight, nine years old, with so many expectations and wishes in their eyes. And um, I think they have only one chance. They will never, they will never have a chance to find an exit if we will not educate them. And it's true. Many educated people misuse their power. But this would never be a reason for me to give up all those who are seeking for better education, especially these young families. So I have to say, from my point of view, uh, education, especially for these younger people, these less privileged people are absolutely crucial and um, important. What other chance do they have? It's not an academic discussion. What else can they do? They have only one chance for their life. Nothing else. Little school room which was so small. 50 young boys and girls in there. So ambitious. Had no idea who I am, of course. They just knew there's someone coming from somewhere. Uh, maybe important. And I think um, it's not, only, it's not only a political decision, I think it's also a very personal decision that we have to help these young people. If you see them, and if you touch them, if you look into their eyes, then you suddenly understand that this is not an abstract discussion. It is their only chance uh, what they have. And therefore, I will intensify this uh, engagement worldwide, not only in one country. About the reform of the Security Council, I can just repeat what I just um, answered your colleague. I'm not here to make proposals for specific models because you know there is an ongoing discussion in New York about this. But I think we have to uh, manage uh, with the reality. And the reality is the way how it, work, how it is now will not work in future. And I think this is what we have to change in the Security Council, and um, I think we, should, um, we shouldn't stop this. We will have the next discussion in, in September. I know that there are many problems on the agenda when we are discussing a restructure of a, or a reform of the United Nations, but I think it's absolutely obvious that this is necessary.
from my point of view, we have to work on this. And I know what the background of your question is. The background of your question is like the background of your question was, what is about this veto? But I mean, we all know we have to be realistic. We can, it's, it's, not, it's not wishful thinking what we are doing. It is what is possible. And if we want to, if we are not able to do uh, 10 steps, we have to do the first step. Because also a marathon starts with the first step. This is the idea. It's a pragmatic um, approach, but I think it's uh, the only way how we can um, better the situation. Thank you very much. And now very, the very last question, and we have to stick with that. Unfortunately, we have breakout sessions starting in theory in 10 minutes, I think in practice in 20 minutes. So please uh, put forward your last question. Okay, um, erstmal auf Deutsch. Uh, ich bin Deutsch Lehrerin, deswegen. Mein Name ist Jita. Ich komme aus Myanmar. Und ich bin Deutsch Lehrerin in Myanmar. Und ich bin hier, um, eine Deutsch Kurs und Goethe Institut zu machen. Und im nächsten Jahr arbeite ich als Deutsch Lehrerin mit Goethe Institut in Myanmar. So, ich freue mich sehr darüber, dass Sie über die neue Präsenz vom Goethe-Institut in Myanmar so gesprochen haben. Ich habe zwei Fragen. Also in erstmal, ich möchte sehr gerne von einer Situation der Deutschlernenden in Myanmar erzählen. In Myanmar gibt es eine fremdsprachige Universität. Es gibt äh, zwischen 200 und 250 Studenten pro Jahr an der Universität, die deutsche Sprache lernen. Aber sie haben Probleme nach ihrem Studium. Sie haben Deutsch drei Jahre lang gelernt, aber sie sind ziellos und sie haben keine genaue Zukunft mit deutscher Sprache. Und nach dem Studium haben sie verlassen, Deutsch weiter zu lernen. So, fortzubilden. Das ist äh, die Seite von Myanmar. Und ich bin hier seit äh, Januar 2012 und ich habe das gesehen, in Deutschland gibt es so viele, also nicht so viele, aber äh, Personen, die Myanmarisch lernen möchten. Aber sie können in Deutschland Myanmarisch nicht lernen. Egal in Berlin oder in Bonn oder überall in Deutschland. Sie können Myanmarisch hier nicht lernen. Also sie haben auch Schwierigkeiten wie unsere. Deswegen ähm, habe ich eine Frage. Äh, haben Sie Interesse an Studentenaustausch zwischen Myanmar und Deutschland? Das heißt, ähm, für beide Seiten äh, deutsche Sprache in Deutsch zu lernen und Myanmarisch in Myanmar zu lernen. Das ist die erste Frage. Und die zweite Frage ist, Goethe-Institut hat Kulturprogramme organisiert. Und sie haben zusammengearbeitet, Kultur in Myanmar herauszufordern. So haben sie Interesse, ich meine nicht nur das Goethe-Institut, sondern auch die anderen Stiftungen wie DAD oder äh, heinrich Böll stiftung oder so andere. Äh, haben sie Interesse, solche Zusammenarbeit für Kultur, so äh, wie Kulturaustauschprogramm? Also das ist meine zweite Frage. Dankeschön. Vielen Dank. Zunächst einmal äh, wirklich äh, herzlichen Glückwunsch zu diesem äh, großartigen Deutsch, das Sie sprechen. Äh, ich will Ihnen sagen, ich bin vor wenigen Wochen ja in Myanmar gewesen und äh, im Mittelpunkt meiner Gespräche in Myanmar war genau die Frage der Intensivierung auch des kulturellen Austausches. Aber es hängt natürlich sehr stark auch von der Öffnung Ihres Landes ab. Wir haben jetzt den Schritt mit Goethe vorbereitet. Wir wollen den, ähm, die Stiftungsarbeit intensivieren. Ich weiß, dass es ein großes Interesse auch der deutschen Stiftungen gibt. Ähm, das hängt aber ganz entscheidend natürlich davon ab, auch wie die Entwicklung in Myanmar weitergeht. Noch ist die Öffnung in Myanmar nicht irreversibel. Ich habe ein langes Gespräch auch geführt mit Dor Aung San Suu Kyi und ähm, es geht natürlich auch um die Frage, wie wir Wirtschaft nach Myanmar bringen, Investitionen nach Myanmar bringen 
Und dann haben auch zu Ihrer ersten Frage viele junge Menschen, die Deutsch lernen, eine ganz andere berufliche Perspektive plötzlich. Denn sie haben dann die Möglichkeit, auch mit deutschen Firmen zusammenzuarbeiten. Sie werden sehr begehrt sein in Myanmar von deutschen Firmen, die natürlich ja auch eine Verbindung brauchen, nicht nur Übersetzung, sondern die ja auch Manager brauchen, das weit über die, die, die weit über die Sprachkompetenz hinausgehen. Also das ist sicherlich ein ganz entscheidender Punkt. Ich will es sagen, ich bin erfreut darüber, dass in Myanmar in den letzten Monaten eine Öffnung stattgefunden hat und ich hoffe, dass es bei diesem Weg bleibt. Wir arbeiten daran, im Rahmen unserer Möglichkeiten, auch natürlich, indem wir mit dem Präsidenten, der auf Reformen setzt, gut zusammenarbeiten. Aber das Entscheidende wird damit zusammenhängen oder wird davon abhängen, ob die Öffnung des Landes vorangeht. Ansonsten kann ich die Fragen, die Sie gestellt haben, nur mit Ja beantworten. Wir haben ein sehr großes Interesse an dem Studentenaustausch, an dem Jugendaustausch, an dem Bildungsaustausch, gerade mit Myanmar. Aber abermals, wir beide wissen, das hängt natürlich sehr stark auch davon ab, welchen inneren Weg Myanmar gehen wird. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. I'm delighted. I wish you a successful discussion and uh, conversation and uh, a beautiful and wonderful stay here in Berlin and in Rhine Valley. Hope to see you. Bitte? Geht noch bis morgen. Bonn. I said, how did I say Berlin? The reason is. Let me, let me be precisely. I'm going now to Berlin and you stay here. All the best. <laughs>